You Rafe Spall, can you please now mimic your dog yapping? Okay. <laughs> Just like it. And what's she called? Lucy. That's for Lucy. you, Lucy. I'm sure she's listening. <laughs> Hi, I'm Izzy Sutty. This is a download from the BBC. For terms and conditions, please go to www.bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio Scotland. Hey, digital downloaders, I'm Kirsty Dream. Now shut up and pay attention. I don't want to be rude, but I'm doing you a favour. Clear the diary, because the next 26 minutes and 32 seconds is going to be the best 26 minutes and 32 seconds of your week. You probably don't believe me, but that's because you don't know what I know. Check this. Coming up, we've got John Richardson, Frank Skinner, Chris Tarrant, you've already heard Rafe Spall and Fred McCauley. But that's not it. There's even more. Like the very excellent Russell Howard. I couldn't do drugs. I like the idea of it. I'm just too scared. I am. I'm sort of scared about most stuff. I'm scared of the dark. This happened on tour. Scared of the dark. My car ran out of petrol. It was two in the morning. I had to make my way to a petrol station. I was so scared, I picked up a stick to protect myself <laughs> against the bad men. I'm literally <laughs> walking on this. Get to me. No word of a lie. 20 minutes later, a police car came by because they'd heard a report there was a blind man <laughs> walking along the road. <laughs> That was the um, the second worst. Of, I had one that's even worse than that the other day with my mum. Right, how about uh-huh. this for strange? So I'm stuck. I'm mean, stuck in tra- traffic. There'd been an accident, and I'm sort of in this odd stage of my life where people recognise me in the car. Yeah. So they're getting out the car to take photos of, of me in the middle of this kind of melee, and my mum was sat in the car next to me and shouted out, "Help! He's kidnapped me!" <laughs> right. That, <laughs> and then suddenly the situation got even weirder. <laughs> Well, they, they genuinely thought that I kidnapped a little uh-huh. old lady who looks a bit like me. <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, good on you, Mum. Yeah, she's funny, man. Good sense of humour. Uh, have you still got that stick? Do you keep it in the car just to, for emergency? No, it was, um, it was on, on the M6. I was je- oh. terrified. I just picked it up and just... I don't know who who I don't know who I thought was going to leap uh, out at three in the morning and attack me. But have you, you ever, ever been, that? Cool. Uh, no, I was just going to ask. Have you ever been threatened with violence? Uh, yeah, many times. Yeah. I'm a comedian. Come yeah. on, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Did you talk your way out of it? Um, I remember what years ago the one the weirdest heckle I ever got was years ago, um, a guy and I was like 18. Uh, it was one of the first gigs I did in Bournemouth, and this guy r- got up really angrily and said, "Have you been having sex with my wife?" And I was kind of. You know, pretty certain that I have to <laughs> have having sex with anyone. What, in the last yeah. 40 minutes? Yeah, well, that was it. it but, and, and he was, Actually, mate, I've got an alibi. And, yeah, exactly. Well, this is it. And he, was, um, and he kind of swung at me. And it was, it was really crazy. Wow. And I was kind of sort of... I still held onto the mic. Uh-huh. was just kind of trying to sort of chat my way through it. And it was really, really scary. And then he kind of left. And it was a bit... And then I tried to carry on. Uh-huh. I think I was doing a bit about, like, Craig David. It was, it was like, years ago. Yeah. yeah anyway, Craig David, something like that, right? <laughs> and then, after about five minutes... Um, this woman kind of walked out, and I went, who are you? And she went, oh, I'm his wife. <laughs> like that, and I was kind of going, surely you could have said at one point, it's not him, Jim, it's not him. But, yeah, that was the the weirdest uh, heckle. That is bizarre. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, but, yeah, so that's the odd, that's the kind of most violent. Uh-huh. Right. So, have you ever had anyone swing at you on stage? Not swing at me, but I, I did a gig in a, 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 over in, a, in Melbourne, yeah. and it was done out, and it was cabaret tables. Yeah. And so there'd be about 12 people at, at, at this big table near the front, and a guy lifted the table up and upended it. Wow. And everybody's glass went. Wow. Uh, I'd been doing a bit about taxi drivers, and <laughs> right. apparently he was a taxi All driver, right. but with issues. But that, that was... No, he sounded like an Aussie Jesus for a minute, and then just kind of lifted it up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the temple tables were turned over. Yeah. Uh, but that... And these things, Russell, are very off-putting, and it, it, People don't really understand how difficult it is to get back into the swing of things. Oh, absolutely. I remember doing a gig. At, oddly, Christmas. Christmas is such a beautiful time for everyone except for comedians because we have to do kind of gigs in front of Christmas yeah. parties. Well, you used to do. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. I take it that's behind you. That, yeah, well, yeah. I sort of stopped doing them like, very early on. My friend Al once had a bloke, get, he had a champagne bottle and he shot the cork at him. Uh-huh. You know, you know, yeah, exactly. So yeah. it kind of would have been the most decadent way of losing an eye. <laughs> what a very middle class yeah, totally. heckle that is. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Champagne, it, please. But it's... it's I don't sh- think Prosecco Corps will reach. <laughs> now listen up, guys. Are you planning to buy your partner lingerie for Christmas? It can be a bit embarrassing, can't it? 
Don't worry, here's born again feminist and metrosexual Fred Macaulay with some valuable advice. Um, you know this, she's exactly the same size as she <laughs> uh, We've got a comedian in our Edinburgh studio, we should introduce him. Comedian Gareth Wall. Good morning, Gareth. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Now, have you, are you betrothed? Have you got a wife? Have you got a girlfriend? Gareth? I've got a girlfriend, yeah. Right. Have you been in this uh, purchasing scenario? Yeah, mine's was horrible. Uh, <laughs> She, the she story, actually, I hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she she asked me to to get for her. No, uh, I know. Yeah, uh-huh. it was horrible. I, I mean, I don't I don't know what I'm doing the best at times. Right. So I went into the place. I didn't really know like what I was looking for. Like you said, that's the wor- worst thing you could do. So I'm in there, kind of just looking about. And I mean, there's so many numbers and digits involved as yes. well. Like I felt like I was doing Sudoku or something. <laughs> it was like yeah. it was ridiculous. And then so I'm looking about, and then the girl that worked there. She came up to me and she was like, oh, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. And she went, no, is it your first time? And I don't really like when a girl says that in any scenario, never mind a public one. I went, yeah, yeah, it's my first time. She went, don't worry, we get guys like you all the time just looking to experiment. <laughs> Seriously? Wow. Yeah, I, went, I, be, I beg your pardon. No, no, this is this is a gift. She went, all right, sorry. I went, yeah, it's from a girlfriend. She went, oh, okay then. Oh, yeah. And I went, no, no, it is. It's from a girlfriend. So and I didn't realise doing this. the inverted commas thing with her yeah. fingers? Yeah. And, oh, and I didn't realise this. girlfriend. It's horrible as well, because I didn't know this about myself. So I've got to walk about with, like, the branded bag all day. Mm-hmm. I know you'll see some, like... Good looking, handsome man walking down with like a like a Lacenza bag or something. You're like, well, he's he's taking that home for some lucky lady. But you look at me, you look at me, and you go, he's probably going to put that on when he gets home. <laughs> okay, we've done underpants. Let's move on to outer garments with star of eight out of ten cats, John Richardson. I bought some uh, maroon trousers the other week. Oh. What? Yeah, never going to wear them. <laughs> no, John Beatty sports a, a pair of maroon trousers now and then. Uh-huh. What what shoe would you wear with a maroon trouser? This is what oh. I do. I see it and I think I could pull that off. And then when I get back, I realise you actually got to plan a whole outfit around something like. A I would be wearing uh, a brown, uh, a brown shoe, a but brown not shoe. a brogue, because then people would think, "Hang on, he thinks he's upper middle class now." <laughs> That's he's exactly what I'm trousers. going for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yep. Yeah. And then next thing it will be red corduroys. Is, what, what, what red, does that mean? Red, red cord, trou- you know, cords, corduroy. Well, I didn't want to tell you this, Fred, but the maroon trouser is a corduroy trouser. Is it? You've, <laughs> you've rumbled me straight away. <laughs> to be honest, most of the chat at BBC Radio Scotland this week was about pants and trousers. We almost missed the referendum. Hmm. Anyway, here's Chris Tarrant talking about his breeks. Because, you know, trousers then were either real thick, like really tight drain pipes. Yeah. The sort of teddy ball look. Although they were those absurd flares, sort of 24-inch bottoms, the great big wide flare. Uh-huh. And some bloke in Birmingham obviously sussed me as a simpleton. Um, and he sold me. I've still got these as well. I can't quite get into the waist, but I nearly can. I, <laughs> and I bought a pair of trousers where one leg is a drain pipe and the other leg is this great wide <laughs> flare. And he said, trust me, mate, trust me, every few years at least one of your legs will always be in fashion. And I bought these things. I genius. love them. Uh-huh. And actually, Why is every... Chris facing the other way? Oh, it, no, it's, fashion. it's the fashion. Class trouser base anecdote there from Chris Tarrant. Frank Skinner in comparison was poor, very poor. Here he is droning on about Doctor Who without any mention of trousers or pants. I played the chief engineer of the Orient Express. Right. Wait for it. In space. (laughs) So he's a sort of working class, salt of the earth type character who's a bit brighter than you expect when you hear the accent. I can't believe that they didn't give the part of a chief engineer on the Orient Express in the space, to a Scotsman. Well, there's so many Scottish people in it now. There's a Scottish doctor and a Scottish master uh-huh. and a Scottish showrunner. But every chief engineer in space is Scottish. Is that right? I suppose <laughs> in, it is a sci-fi tradition, indeed. <laughs> there has to be some English content. It's in Wales, made by Scottish people, starring Scottish people. Uh-huh. Give us a break. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I'll let, the, let you off with that one. Of course, the other thing we know Frank from is his BBC Two series, Room 101. Here's some sneak previews of the upcoming series. Len, Len Goodman, I remember particularly, because one of his choices was all foreign food. Right. <laughs> Which he said to me that his dad used to say, oh, his granddad used to say, never eat anything you wouldn't like to tread in. Right. 
So he's um, he's fairly old school. <laughs> so everything that was foreign goes. Um, he, he, yes, right. everything. And he also admitted he'd never had a curry in his life, right. which was pretty incredible. I'm guessing that you don't allow him that, but we need to leave that to the, the listeners and the viewers to find out. Exactly. Yeah. Brendan O'Carroll um, did those little pedal bins that you get in hotel toilets. Yeah. I like it when people specialise. Oh, like. man. Well done, Brendan, for that. I'm so with him. And Bob Mortimer did... Um, he did uh, when you... Your, Receipt and your money is handed back to you in the same hand when you pay at the supermarket. <laughs> Big excitement at the start of the week was the climax of our Children in Need auction. Up for grabs was 12 VIP tickets to see Kevin Bridges. Gary, allow me to interrupt. It's at £920 and ticking down. 15 seconds to go. Uh, oh, that's great. I've got a 15-second gag. Oh, I can't do that because I've said I've got a 15-second gag. So I've, I've got a 10-second one. Is that any good? £1,120 and it's closed. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. I've done live auctions. I did one on Friday, and people do get carried away. They do, and they and they'll say after us, "Oh, I really, I thought they were going to come back in." The person I was bidding <laughs> against, I thought they would come back in, <laughs> and now I've spent away more than I intended to. <laughs> and then you go, "Hey, mate, it's for charity. Do you want to make a deal out of this? <laughs> do you want me to run the video again?" <laughs> also with us was tech guru Gary Marshall telling us how to childproof our technology. Have you got any defence if your <laughs> child happens to hit your pad at the right number of times and makes a purchase? No. Right? No. no and seriously. Th- this is one of the things that happened in the early days, particularly of the iPad, when, when people were letting the kids go on, on the app, and because they had signed in previously to buy stuff, and the kids uh-huh. were just pressing buttons, purchases. But Somebody just, just phoned in and said that the kids just bought Kevin Bridges tickets. <laughs> 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 It's that time of the week to cast our gaze over the stories that have been making the headlines with a couple of countries' top comedic minds. We have in our Glasgow studio comedian Chris Forbes, comedian and actor and writer. Hello. Chris Forbes, yes, multi-talented. And in our Brighton studio, uh, making our Five Things debut, a welcome back to the programme, though, for Jen Brister. Hello, Jen. Hi, Fred, how are you? I'm awfully well. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you for asking. I think you must have been gigging with an old pal of mine recently, John Maloney. Oh, yeah, I that's right. I saw that he had, he had mentioned you, I think, either on Twitter or on Facebook, saying, top it, act. We Yeah, we gigged together, actually, in Brighton. We gigged at, it, uh, at the Comedia. Yeah, it was lots of fun. How is the Comedia these days? I, I love it. I think maybe the stand and the Comedia are my favourite oh. places to perform, definitely. I've, I've never not done it. I used to go to Brighton and do the Crocodile. Well, the Crocodile? The Crocodile. That must have been way back when, It Fred. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was barely born. Yeah, I'm oh, such a right. liar. I was so alive then. <laughs> all righty. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It was Terry Garrigan that used to host it. Do you, does that name mean anything? No. All right. Brighton, Brighton Bottle Orchestra. Do you right. remember the Brighton Bottle Orchestra? No, this is you're just Jane. giving me a series of things. <laughs> when did you move to about. Brighton? You, honestly, uh. March. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. It's a great town. It is. I love it. Uh, I love yeah, it. Yeah, me too. And people used to say to me, "What is Brighton like?" And it's like nowhere else in the world. It's all on its own. I know. I saw a guy. Um, bearing in mind how cold it is, just oh. outside as I was walking to the studio this <gasps> he morning, wasn't. and he <laughs> he was uh, semi clad. Uh, uh-huh. Just sort of uh, fire uh, juggling, just fire ah, right. juggling, and, and nobody better an eyelid. Nobody no. better. Everyone's like, "Yeah, it's Brighton. Of course you are." Yeah, that would well be because Brighton has a, a nudie beach. I'm led to believe. Yes, it does near the marina. Yeah, not that I know. Well, but, no, uh, nor me. I, I didn't ever venture on it or towards it because I didn't really think that you had a beach. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a pile you, of you stones. You had a pile of stones near the, near the seaside. That's what you have there. It's just a very big Japanese garden. It's what we've got <laughs> by water. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's get to the news. And the first headline is for you, Chris. Tony Scare. <laughs> it had to come up. <laughs> yeah, uh, you were absolutely right. Uh, the story's about, obviously, Tony <laughs> Blair's absolutely cringeworthy uh, Christmas card uh-huh. that he's put out which is uh, incredible. Uh, people obviously saying it looks like this horrific kind of grimace rather than a than a grin. And uh, 
it's incredible. I think it, the, I love the fact it says seasons greetings on it. You know, it, uh-huh. I think it's just it was possibly the wrong holiday. Had it come out at Halloween, people would have thought that's a great picture for Halloween that looks terribly scary. He's quite kind of wolfish in it with the teeth. Yeah. This is the thing that looks like Sherry's kind of holding him back <laughs> in the kind of some sort of scene. Uh, it and is, it's, it's a grimace, isn't it? Uh, it's, it also feels like with all the stuff that's been going around recently with like iCloud leaks and people saying, oh, how did they get a hold of these photos? It's almost like that's. I, I thought he was going to come out and say, oh, how did anyone get a hold of this? This is a private <laughs> picture because it's that bad. But no, he said, no, this is actually it, our official photo. It looks like he's been CGI'd onto it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think it's the same. It looked like it would be a Photoshop thing. I think yeah. there was quite a lot of disbelief that it wasn't just someone on the internet had made this up yeah. in a wee Photoshop and... Uh, but he, no, it's 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 real. It makes you wonder what the, the first photo would have been like because there's no uh, way this was just like we'll take one shot. photo. Yeah, yeah so this was like this, the, this was the best <laughs> picture of the month of possibly you know twenty to fifty to a hundred pictures. So I'd love to see the first one. I never met Tony Blair, um, and I don't I doubt I ever will. But Cherie Blair came into the studio when she was punting her book. Right, she's charming. Yeah, utterly charming. Yeah, quite. I can imagine. Quite a character. Some, one of them um, has to be. <laughs> have you have you received a card from the Blairs, Jen? They won't may, maybe know uh, your address if you've n- only been in Brighton a few months. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is where I, I've got... I tell you what I have got. I've got a bottle of port uh-huh. signed by Tony Blair, uh, Gordon Brown and Neil Kinnock. Wow. From the House of Lords. Uh, no, don't, don't that I know I'm practically right. a select, I'll keep it in a Hang cabinet. on to that. Have you you haven't opened it? I did actually. Did you? <laughs> I've got a bottle of whiskey with Tony Blair's autograph on it. Uh, I actually, well, I've still I'll got the see bottle. your port <laughs> and <laughs> raise you a bottle uh, of single malt. Right. Uh, no, I think you probably win then. No, but, not um, at all. No, I no, no. You Kinnock, Blair and Brown on the one bottle. That that's impressive. But it's a now that's empty so... bottle thanks to uh, um, Australian comedian Hannah Gadsby <laughs> who drank it all. <laughs> I've got oh, a bottle of books. She's a devil for the port, isn't she? She's a devil. Yeah. He looks like the Grinch, actually. You know the Christmas the gr- Grinch. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think you just can't trust a man that grits his teeth when he smiles. I mean, there's something creepy about that. Oh God, I'm in a photo of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Here's headline number two for you, Jane. Oh. Queen for a DNA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apparently shock of horrors, it's been revealed that there may be proof of illegitimacy, illegitimacy within the royal family uh-huh. uh, line dating back to Richard III and this apparently is news. Now, I don't really understand how this is news because the possibility of infidelity in any family is not a shock, is it? Um, but what they've said is that they've, from the DNA of the skeleton that they dug up, which they are now almost 99.99% convinced is Richard III, yep. you know, from under that car park. Yep. Um, they have uh, worked out that there is a Y chromosome that doesn't match one of the five living individuals who claim to have a paternal link with that king. So what I think is, why is succession passed down from father to son? Mm-hmm. If you want to make sure that the line is pure, surely the only way to make sure of that is mother to daughter. Let's switch it around. Oh, Jane. Come that on. is a faultless argument. It's like, the only way you can be It's the sure. only way you can be 100% sure it goes down from uh-huh. mother to daughter. And sorry, guys, you're like, you, you've been sidelined. That is the only way. You're welcome, by the way. Uh-huh. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't argue with that. As, as, a, as a newborn feminist myself, I am wholly with you. And also, biologically, it's like you, can't, you can't argue with it. No. It's, once it's popped out there, you're like, oh, that Absolutely. looks like it must be the real thing. Yeah. And How many know, women can you say, have you had any children? And they go, eh. Not really. Of course, yes, I have. <laughs> no, I can't be remember. certain if it's mine. Um, so, but that's the news, apparently. It so, is. And, uh, but no one, obviously, is saying that the Queen uh, doesn't have her oh. uh, rightful place as uh, the Queen or whatever. <laughs> I love unless you're not into the, unless you're anti-monarchy, in which case well, you will be saying that, irrespective and of Nothing to do lineage. with the DNA of it all, but people are wondering, you know, why, why was his spine so twisted? They'd build a car park on them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't nap in a car park in Leicester. It's unfortunate that he, he was found under a... It's not very, I don't know, it's not very it's regal, not is it? Of a, no, no, not becoming a of a king. Plantagenet, no. Um, <laughs> we need to gallop on. Here's the third story, Chris. AI goodbye to X and Y. Yeah, uh, this is all about... Cryptic. Um, Stephen Hawking 
here. Yes. He's, he's come out and he's been warning uh, about the uh, apocalyptic threat that artificial, artificial intelligence poses to people. Um, he was saying the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race, mm. uh, no less, which is, I mean, I... I He'd also said something earlier in the year. I mean, this has come out, and he's, he's saying that, and, and people have seen this a lot in, in movies. You know, this kind of thing happen, and he's been warning of these kind of apocalyptic events all year. He'd come out uh, earlier as well, saying, yeah. talking about uh, aliens, and he said uh, that the contact with extraterrestrial aliens could be similarly destructive, leading to the extermination of the human uh-huh. race. Oh my god! And I think what's happened is. He spent his whole life being absolutely brilliant and kind of doing, you know, talks and books and, and being coming up with these amazing things that he's just ran out and he's finally just <laughs> been chilling out and watching uh-huh. films and right. he's like maybe just seen the Terminator and he went, oh, that's a terrible idea. He said, do people know this is happening? <laughs> and then the next day he maybe watched Independence Day and went, God, aliens are horrific as well. And so now well, he's just quick, kinda... somebody get him a copy of Interstellar. Oh, you know. <laughs> So, but yeah, this is him, and it, it, you know, it's it, it's a terrible thing, uh-huh. and, and the possibility of it could happen. And you know, people are always worried about the future. And, yeah, and when a machine can build a machine, over. yes, uh-huh. and defend itself, they start thinking for themselves. Uh-huh. Uh, this is the thing he said uh, that it could take off on its own and redesign itself at yep. an ever increasing rate. And uh, you know, kind of like a like a slimy politician, they'll just they'll keep coming and then they'll, they'll take over. But I mean, the human brain is an incredibly complex. Yeah, machine, mm-hmm. right? And I'm I'm in my fifties, and I've barely started to think for myself. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I think we're okay. <laughs> I know. I think the bots will be a wee bit behind us, will they not? You know, Jen, how how do you feel about artificial intelligence? Oh, I don't even like it when my phone talks to me. You know, when you <laughs> accidentally press the button and it says, "What would you like to know?" and you're like, "Oh, that freaks me out. I find that creepy." Have um, you ever used that facility? I haven't, but I nobody it does. Was, I don't think anyone does. Was it called Siri or something? Yeah. yeah, I don't use that. I use it for phoning people in the car, but I have to put on like a really proper voice. Oh, like yeah. if I'm phoning my mate, like James or something, uh-huh. who, he's um, called Jane. Hibs in my phone because he's a big Hibs fan. Right. And uh, I'll say like phone Hibs and it'll be like, I do not understand. And then you have to say phone Hibs. <laughs> <laughs> Phoning Hibs. <laughs> So you got to be, you got to really know how to use it, right? You've got to have an RP accent to make it work. Mm, yeah. That's what they're saying. Yep. Um, and uh, another Stephen Hawking story. He's got a new computer, and uh, the, his voice. He was given the option of a different voice, but he likes yeah. the voice that he's got. Yeah. And it's also a voice that, uh, unfortunate people who need uh, a, a, an artificial voice are choosing as well. Yeah, that's great. That's it. So uh, you know, and there's, uh, people have been pointing out the irony of the story as well that he's actually chosen to stick with the more robotic voice uh-huh. because he knows that's his kind of trademark as yeah. well. But, and uh, he was offered a kind of an English kind of RP accent as yeah. well. So, he, um, but no, he's, he's stuck with it. So it's amazing to think he could have chosen any accent. We could have had Stephen Hawking talking in some sort of kind of Jamaican yeah. accent. Would have been <laughs> just to mix things up. <laughs> oh, could have been be crazy. Great. With Jamaican <laughs> a lot of street cred, you know. Me can't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jane, yeah. yes. We're going to move on. Oh, right. This, this is fast and furious today. Oh, my goodness. Already, we're at the fourth story. Right. This story is about. Oh, Page got... three, material girl. Yeah, you, you knew what the you story was the story. before you even <laughs> heard the headline. Do you know what? I'm just, I'm ahead of the game. What you can really I tell you really um, are. Uh... The listeners are going, hang on, they might even know what's coming up. <laughs> what makes no, you think no. that? They don't do that in television. Um, <laughs> ever? No, they don't have writers either. This is um, about Madonna. Yes who recently had some photos taken where uh, her breasts were revealed. I think, am I allowed to say breasts on the BBC? You can. I've said it, it's out there. And everyone's got an opinion about it for some reason. Um, I'm not really sure what the problem is. It's like nobody's heard of Madonna before. Have you seen her back catalogue? Um, not in the, the photo that I saw. Well, the photos are very <laughs> provocative. And also, I think they're more provocative because she's, you know, 56. And I think that's what everyone's upset about. But I absolutely expect Madonna to have provocative photographs taken of her at 56. What I don't expect is for her to be sitting in a kitchen with a cup of tea and a Garibaldi reading Woman's <laughs> Own. I want Madonna to be out there yep. in a topless basque in, dressed in Alexander McQueen gear in some various contortions. I expect that from Madonna. Uh-huh. I That's get, kind of the thing, isn't that it? Is, uh, is, I get more offended when I see her launching a children's book and she wears a twin set and a big brooch. <laughs> yeah, that's and a, a pair of brogues. Yeah. Um, and then there was the Loose Women, they were discussing it, apparently. Really? And, and, uh, and uh, Janet Street Porter apparently said that uh, she, it was attention-seeking. Yes! 
Of mm. course it's attention-seeking. It's Madonna. We want her to be attention-seeking. So I, I love that she's out and about with all of what's it's out, 59, 56, whatever. One, I mean, it's not like I look at Madonna and go, well, that is the body of a 56-year-old woman. Mm. I am fully aware that that is the body yeah. of a plastic surgeon. <laughs> 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 Had yes. a lot. Yep. I mean, it, it'd be, it would be slightly more, um, I don't know, it'd be slightly more brave and slightly more controversial, I think, if Madonna was semi-naked and had her actual breasts out, you know, just two spaniels ears looking very sad. <laughs> well, it, it did it. stop me looking at her hands. I'll say that. <laughs> and the photo I showed, it was, it was Kay Adams that showed me it. It was Kay Adams that showed me the photo. And I haven't looked for, to see if there's any you more. don't look at a woman's but, hands on neck, I'll Fred. tell you this, uh, I've got the book. Remember she brought a book out? Uh, yes, yes. I yes. bought that as a collector's item. Yeah. How much was it worth? I now? think it was a bit. Well, I think it was 30 quid, and I think you can maybe get about 12 for it now. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes to go, but yeah, talking about the. Uh, the, the implants and such like I see Katie Price is, uh, she's going to get uh, new breasts as you've so rightly called them Jane and <laughs> it's just like anybody that thinks oh god how can you admire Katie Price all you're admiring are her surgeon skills <laughs> and two prosthetics right you might as well look at an 87 year old woman's hips <laughs> <laughs> final story <laughs> get out claws Chris, who's, who's getting out? Uh, the, this this was actually brilliant. It, it really makes me chuckle because there's a, like a little bit of a kind of uh, a kind of uh, you know mischievous kind of sadist and everyone yeah. that likes to kind of see children suffer in, in a kind of <laughs> nonchalant way at Christmas time when it comes to seeing Santa kind of being in, in, in awful situations. <laughs> it's uh, a serious time. Yeah, uh, but yeah, there was uh, someone was uh, dressed up as, as Santa Claus as they do at this time mm -hmm. of year uh, at uh, uh, Aberdeer in Sinan Valley and uh, at the end of his kind of stint as posing as, as Santa and where the kids come up and they sit in his knee and tell them what they want for Christmas, he was uh, escorted off the premises uh, by a police fan. So this was he was he was merely just getting a lift away, but uh, everyone in the audience, obviously the kids mostly, were shocked that their beloved Santa Claus looked like he'd been arrested uh, and led <laughs> off and just driven away down the street. And uh, it was brilliant. People were kind of reporting on it, and kids were shouting out, saying, "Oh, Santa's been arrested!" And <laughs> I'm not going to get my toys this year. And I just think this is hilarious. Picturing these children absolutely upset, crying their eyes out uh, because they haven't had this realization yet, and also the fact that some of them might. I felt like uh, distrusted, like they've been, uh, like Santa's maybe been undercover, and they've just been kind of spilling their guts about if uh -huh. they've been good or bad this year. And now <laughs> found out he's worked with the police, and they're like, "Tell you what, look out for wee Jimmy McCullough over here. He's he's been miserable. He stole five pence from his mum's hand purse or something." But so, so Santa's a grass. Aye. <laughs> <laughs>